Well, good morning and welcome to this reflection for the sixth Sunday of Easter. Um, I hope you've spent some time already in worship preparing for this reflection. There's a downloadable order of service um, available on the Facebook page or the parish website where you'll find uh, the readings and some liturgy and prayers and also some links to songs that you can use to frame this reflection. And I do encourage you to use it. We're going to start our time together um, today, though, with some words from Psalm 66. Um, I'm going low tech again. Good old cardboard. So as I flip this, um, do just join in with the words. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his name glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. Sing the glory of his name. All the earth bows before you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Make his name glorious. Come and see what God has done. His awesome deeds among mortals. Sing the glory of his name. Make his name glorious. Amen. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Those are all wonderful words of praise, aren't they, from today's psalm. Actually, it reminded me that Vicar David nominated this year, 2020, as the year for which our church community um, is supposed to be focusing and developing our worship. With all that's been going on with the coronavirus and the lockdown, I'd actually lost sight of that. But actually, this situation gives us a wonderful opportunity to reflect on worship. How do we do it? Indeed, what is it? Why do we do it? And perhaps most importantly, who or what do we worship? Lockdown has enabled us to consider new ways of doing worship. As a leadership team, we've been focusing on trying to provide resources online. It's been a steep learning curve, as you know. Um, and as we've experimented, we've tried to determine what works best. And in putting together these new forms and styles of worship, we've had to consider what's important, what matters, what's necessary to facilitate worship. And then the online experience as a worshipper has also challenged me. Not being in a building surrounded by other worshippers, there's definitely a temptation to become more of a consumer, isn't there? Dipping in and out, fast forwarding the boring bits or critiquing and making comments throughout the presentations. It's also tempting to just superficially worship, perhaps multitasking while the service is going on, making a cup of tea while singing Thine Be the Glory or filling the dishwasher when listening to the prayers or having a text conversation during the reflection. I hope you're not doing that right now. There's an anonymity and an unaccountability that comes with this style of online worship that does actually test our commitment. It highlights the issue that providing or using a resource, be it film or liturgy or music, doesn't necessarily engender an attitude of worship. There's got to be something more. That's down to the individual, down to you or me, if it's me watching, and our own response to God. With the buildings locked down and with no gathering of fellow Christians to join in liturgy, with music limited to our own warbling renditions or canned recordings, this is bare bones time. Time to strip away all the trappings and see actually what we've got left. Some of you will know well the Matt Redman worship song that he wrote following a time at their church when they bravely stopped all formal worship and simply gathered together regularly to wait on God as they sought a new way forward. It goes like this. It's okay, I'm not going to sing it. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's a worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. There we are again, the heart. Last time I did a reflection, I spoke about the heart, you may remember. And the Hebrew understanding that the heart includes heart and mind and will. And worship involves all three, our emotions, our thoughts and our volitions. But it also involves our souls and our bodies too. For it's a fulfilment of the first and greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, it adds in the Greek New Testament, with all your soul and with all your strength. 
worship is a whole life thing. And it's not dependent on the externals. It's all about God and it involves all of one's being. So if you're on a desert island with no books and no music, no internet, could we still worship? Yeah, of course. Why? Because God is still God and we still have a heart. And if in coronavirus lockdown, isolated at home, can we still worship? Of course. God is still God and you still have a heart. The wise words of the teacher in Ecclesiastes say that God has set eternity in the heart of man. People today interpret that as we're each created with a God-shaped hole which hankers to know the one true God. When good things happen, when people celebrate, it's natural for us to want to give thanks and praise, even if people don't know where to direct that. Similarly, when in need, it's natural to cry out for help to something other than ourselves. Again, whether or not one knows to whom or what that cry is directed. And perhaps this is evidenced by the increase in numbers engaging with church and prayer activities online at the moment during this pandemic. As David mentioned in his briefing, worship is innate in human beings. And that is also evidenced in Athens that we read in, our, in Acts 17, our reading today. When Paul arrived at this great capital city, he was distressed to see how the city, however beautiful physically, was full of or smothered by or under the influence of so many idols. There was a Roman satirist of the time that joked of Athens that it's easier to find a god there than a man. There was a huge statue of Athena in the Parthenon. Elsewhere, images of Apollo and Bacchus and Neptune and Diana, the whole Greek pantheon of gods were present. Idolatry was rampant. The people were giving expression to this inbuilt desire to worship something other outside of themselves. Now, one might think that idolatry is not a, an issue for our modern day, that stone and metal carved figures of worship were only prevalent in primitive societies. However, idolatry is sadly alive and well. It's just that our idols are different. Anything that one puts in pride of place over and above a relationship with God is an idol, breaking that second commandment. You should have no other gods before me. John Stott, in his commentary on Acts, says that idolatry can take many forms. Firstly, he says, it's as if we dethrone God. That's when we demote God to below other more important things in our lives that take up our time, our attention, our devotion. This is perhaps the most obvious idol that we might think of. But whether it be a person, a thing or an ideology, people, parents or spouses, pets, children or friends can be idols. Activities, sport, TV, holidays, even work can be an idol. Comforts, food, drink, sex can be idols. Our possessions, our homes, our wealth or other material goods can be idols. Even ourselves, our health, our appearance, our intellectual prowess can be an idol. Or as, as I alluded to earlier, things that aid religious expression, our church buildings, the music, the liturgy can become for us an idol. Any of us may be tempted to allow these things to surreptitiously increase in importance in our lives, relegating God to a lower position. Stott also says that idolatry can take the form of localising God, confining him within imposed limits, or domesticating God, considering him answerable to us, or using him for our comfort. You may be familiar with those words... I like to think of God as, or to me, God is. It's dangerous thinking. I know in a postmodern world, we have to be careful with our words if you want to engage in meaningful dialogue with others about God. But the danger is that we begin to think of God as a thing that we can design, that we mould to our way of thinking. We create him in our image. This is a form of idolatry. And then Stott's other last listed form of idolatry is when we alienate God. He says when we blame him for his distance or for his silence. Essentially, that is actually what the philosophers in Athens did. Both the Epicureans and the Stoics that Paul that are mentioned in that reading in Acts thought that God was far off. 
The Epicureans made a god out of pleasure. The Stoics, more fatalist, relied on human endeavour to meet all their needs, essentially making God out of humankind. And I think both these tendencies are rec can be recognised in our modern world. Now, when Paul saw all these idols in Athens, he was greatly distressed, it says. I think that's actually a bit of an understatement. The word used is paroxysmo, from which we get the word paroxysm. It was a gut-wrenching reaction, as if he wanted to vomit. These idols were spiritually abhorrent to him. This was a holy and righteous reaction to idolatry. And so we hear Paul's famous speech in response to him seeing an altar to an unknown God. What you worship as unknown, he says, I am going to proclaim to you. And then he proceeds to tell of the creator of heaven and earth, of the sustainer of all life, of the sovereign of times and places, of the father of us all and of the judge of humankind. This is the one true God. This is the God who is worthy of worship. And not only does Paul describe this God, but he says something quite shocking to his hearers. This God that he's described to them can be known. Unlike the images of stone or metal or ivory, unlike the pursuit of pleasure or wealth or health, this God is a personal God who seeks relationship with those he has created. He is not far from any one of us, Paul says. And then he quotes from their own prophets, in him we live and move and have our being. Now, sadly, only a few accepted Paul's message that day, as opposed to the thousands that were converted in Jerusalem at Pentecost. These Epicurean and Stoic philosophers loved to talk about God, to debate and to argue, but their hearts were closed to knowing him in a personal way. Knowing about God is not the same as knowing God. Only knowing about him intellectually, factually, is not going to lead to worship. Yes, it's an important part of the process of knowing God, but it's not enough. Through it we may go through the motions, but worship, true worship, arises from the heart in a response when that knowledge becomes a personal experience. It's two Greek words for to know, to know factually or to know experientially. The second kind of knowing is the same word used by the Hebrews for that intimate, even sexual relationship within a marriage, the way a husband knows a wife. This, staggeringly, is the kind of knowing that God wants with us. A knowing that comes from spending time together, from listening to one another, from understanding the other, and for, which leads to loving the other deeply and intimately. And God takes the initiative in this. He has revealed himself through his creation, through his word, through his son, Jesus, and through his spirit. In our second reading from John's Gospel, we hear Jesus speaking to his disciples, promising the Holy Spirit to them. He says, the world cannot accept him because it cannot see him nor knows him. But he goes on to say that his disciples know him because he is with them and in them. God's Spirit is with us and in us. The Spirit of God, as for the new converts at Pentecost, can make our knowledge about God move from the head to the heart, make it personal. It's a spirit that lets us cry out, Abba, Father, that intimate name. J.I. Packer, in his classic book, Knowing God, it's old but good, says that the process to make this transition from head to heart knowledge is demanding but simple. And he says it's that we turn each truth about God into a matter for meditation before God, leading to prayer and praise to God. And then Packer goes on to describe the lost art of meditation that makes that possible. Meditation is the activity of calling to mind and thinking over and dwelling on and applying to oneself the various things that one knows about the works and ways and purposes and promises of God. It is an activity of holy thought 
consciously performed in the presence of God, under the eye of God, by the help of God, as a means of communion with God. Its purpose is to clear one's mental and spiritual vision of God and to let his truth make its full and proper impact on one's mind and heart. And then our worship arises from knowing our God. We will not ever fully comprehend God. He's too big, too mysterious, too other. My ways are not your ways, nor are my thoughts your thoughts, declares the Lord, as it says in Isaiah. But despite that, God chooses to let himself be known to us in ways that we can understand. Packer suggests thinking of an invitation to meet an exalted person, maybe the Queen or Prince Harry, or if you're not a royalist, maybe some other admired personage. We might attend the meeting, but we know that it's up to them how much they're going to open up to us. We might expect some small talk, passing the time of day. They may express some superficial interest in, in what we've been doing. And there's no offence taken by us. We wouldn't expect any more. But imagine if that exalted personage opened themselves up and made themselves vulnerable to us, making themselves known to us. How honoured. What a privilege. You might feel overwhelmed. And so it is with God, but so much more. The creator, the almighty, chooses to reveal himself to us. And more than that, he knows us completely and yet loves us completely. Warts and all, he cannot be disillusioned by the things we do. This is the grace of God that he desires intimacy with us. Staggering but true. Does it not inspire worship? Oh, there's so much more I could say. I've actually got three more pages which I've cut. I didn't think you'd want to be here till tea time. However, I do invite you over the next few days to perhaps meditate some more on the character of God, to let heart knowledge, head, sorry, head knowledge sink deeply into heart knowledge and to cause a spring of worship to well up within you. Perhaps you could meditate on each of those five attributes of God that Paul described to the Athenians, the creator, the sustainer, the sovereign, the father, the judge. Let's take the opportunity of this coronavirus lockdown to come back to the heart of worship by getting to know God again. It's a beautiful thing, this gift of worship, that when we worship God in spirit and in truth, we are the ones who are changed. We are uplifted. That great preacher Spurgeon says, contemplating God humbles the mind, expands the mind and consoles the mind. And boy, don't we need some consolation at the moment. A reminder of that great hymn, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth shall grow strangely dim in the light of his sovereign and grace. I've forgotten the last word, something in grace. It rhymes anyway. So I'm just going to leave you to finish off your worship service, perhaps using some of the ideas in the downloadable document. It includes links to those songs, including turn your eyes upon Jesus. And if, if you'd like, I'll see you later in the Zoom room. Uh, we're going to be having an agape meal in which we can share bread and wine together. That'll be at quarter past 11. Um, I'm afraid you have to provide your own and bring a candle and some matches with you as well. And I'll be there from just after 11 so we can get ready to start promptly at quarter past. And then as usual, we'll continue in fellowship over coffee uh, from 11.30. Thank you. God bless. <laughs>